Very warm welcome to everybody for this uh, meeting tonight with, uh, on the question of the, the paper uh, risk, Climate Risk Reporting Practices by UK Insurance Companies and Pension Schemes. And this working party has produced the paper which we're going to uh, discuss tonight. So it's been quite an interesting time, I think, over the last uh, few months. I think it's the government has said we have a climate emergency. And uh, one commentator uh, likened it to a, a climate spring. A climate spring. So I hope it doesn't go, go the same way as uh, some of the, the other springs we've had in earlier years. Um, but there does seem to be an encouraging, at least in this country, a consensus amongst the, the political parties, which is all adding to the momentum. And um, of course, it's, it's one thing to make to uh, set down your objectives, it's another thing to actually meet those objectives, but you, it's a start anyway to actually define your objectives, so at least we know where we're going. Uh, and it's, it, it, of course it's a global issue, and um, the recommendations we, on the climate disclosure recommendations we're going to be discussing tonight are um, were the product of a, an international uh, body, which um, we're going to be uh, talking about. It affects all, all of us, um, and it affects us at actuaries. It's about two years now since the uh, two things happened. One was the, uh, the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures issued its recommendations, and the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries published a risk alert um, requiring actuaries to consider what they should be doing uh, about climate change. So it's a, an appropriate anniversary of those um, events. The paper uh, today, it's part of this journey um, along the road to uh, improve our practices and our preparation for climate change. But I think it's a, a very important, very useful uh, contribution to that, um, which, which Paul's going to be um, talking about. Uh, Dr. Paul Clumps, um, on my left, um, is uh, an unusual uh, participant in, in these halls in that he's, uh, he's not an actuary, he's an accountant uh, by training. Training. He holds um, academic positions at Birmingham University, Nottingham Business School. He was press professor of accounting at Abu Dhabi University, Nottingham Business School, EDEC Business School in France. He was Chair of Accounting at Imperial College London and Professor of Risk Accounting at Nottingham University Business School. He holds a law degree and various um, other degrees and a PhD from the University of New South Wales. He's a Fellow of the Australian uh, CPA Society, which I, I think is Certified Public Accountant. Uh, and he's an Honorary fellow, fellow of the Institute of Actuaries. So it's especially uh, appropriate that we welcome him here, him here today. His research interests cover the interrelationship of public policy and voluntary reporting, regulation, financial management, and control of financial services, particularly related to pensions and life assurance. He's, he's had been consulted in, in relation to various financial, industrial, um, and government organizations in the area of risk management and other reporting uh, issues. He is chairman of the working party which uh, produced this paper tonight. Uh, he chose to take up a professor of business position in Fujara in August, and he then apparently plans to go back to Australia to start playing golf. I have no idea why, but uh, or to <laughs> see him playing golf. Paul, I'd like you to uh, call upon you now to present your paper. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much, Paul, for the introduction. I know it's a topic of interest to the actors, as we know. Paul's introduction on the professional accountant, so I only pretend to be an actuary, but. 
for some reason, a lot of the issues you are facing, I, I find very interesting, and the actuaries do take leadership um, as a professional body. You know, we had lots of discussion about that just at the coffee time as well. So I want to contribute this with the work that we've done uh, as a working party. Um, I've been involved in various working parties, but this one is particularly of interest, I'm sure, to lots of people. So great to see so many of you turn up tonight. So I hope I will try to get through the presentation um, in, in a concise manner. So I'll be skating over quite a lot of the content. You have got the paper and the PowerPoints hopefully available if you need to know the detail. Um, so as I said, in this next 30 minutes or so, I'm, I'm just going to really give you a high view of what we've done. Uh, it's important to have the institutional background uh, so you can see where the climate change comes from. And then a little bit about the literature. Uh, and then, as I said, we are a working party. We're not a, you know, full time academics at the moment. So the work we're doing is just kind of tipping the edge of the iceberg, if you like, on, on, on this kind of really important area of work. Um, so as I said, I need to put this slide up because, um, you know, we, we've had quite a lot of work on this, but we're not, you know, we recognise that we're kind of volunteers and we're not going to give a definitive uh, view on the topic. Um, and in fact, you know, it's just a fast moving space. So, you know, uh, climate change, uh, you know, developments have been going on almost daily. We, we've done our best to keep up to date, but we, you know, you'll see there is a few caveats as we go through. So as I said, we're really just uh, making an initial hit on this. I am aware that there are other working parties in, in the Institute looking at different aspects of the topic. Um, as you can see from Paul's introduction, my background is more accountability. Um, and so in particular, I think the task force for talks for climate financial disclosures, uh, which is related to the Financial Sta uh, Stability Board, uh, that they are really leading uh, a lot of the generic um, general purpose reporting on the topic. Um, the other kind of interest to, to, to our working party is specifically from an actuarial perspective, what's its impact on insurance and on pension schemes? And I think this is where we're going to make an original, hopefully, contribution that we're looking at this particular sector, and I know many uh, of, the, of you in the audience will have some resonance with these sectors. Um, and I think the other thing that's going to kind of just slightly clarify as we go through, we are not looking at environment, social governance reporting, we're looking at climate risk reporting. So, so that's kind of a slight delineation. It's particularly important for the pension schemes in the light of the recent parliamentary inquiries that have been going on. Um, so as I said, the TCFD, um, I mean, you know, Michael Bloomberg and all these kind of really top guys um, are, are, are kind of being accountable and wanting to have uh, a specific set of recommendations. So as I'll point out in a minute, the main focus of, of our work is the Task Force for Climate Change Disclosures, which came out 2017, Status Report 2018, and New Status Report 2019. And this is going to take a while. Um, and they're looking at these specific four areas, which I'll define in a minute. Now, in addition to that, or separate from that, so this is really what you might call high level, global, voluntary disclosures, which are mainly targeted to uh, companies that are reporting to stakeholders through annual reports. In addition to that, in, this, in the UK specific context, which is not mentioned by TCFD, obviously the Prudential Regulatory Authority has been issuing guidance to insurers in 2015 in connection with the physical transition liability risks, and then they updated that. And on the, on the pension scheme side, we haven't had so much action from the regulator but we've had quite a lot of action from the Parliamentary Environmental Audit Committee, which is in effect forced uh, transparency from pension scheme trustees to come out about where they're up to. So I'll be mentioning some of these things as we go on. 
In terms of where we've come from, we've kind of emigrated quite a bit. So actually, I was working with Colin Ledley and uh, a lot of people working in the area of corporate governance originally, where we're looking at risks generally. So obviously, under the revised corporate governance code, there is a requirement, one of which is that UK companies must come clean about um, the generic obligation to say, you know, what's their financial viability moving forward, as well as risk management policies. So that's a generic issue. What we've tried to do is then move that on and look at the environmental risk space. And then I was actually here at an event which I think Paul was actually presenting at, which I believe was run by the Research Environment Board. Uh, about 18 months ago where there was this focus on climate change. So we uh, uh, emigrated from environmental risk to climate risk. And that's an important clarification for tonight. And I will cl I'll clarify this subtle difference between the two. Uh, also, thanks to Matthew Gout and Emily. Also, we do thank uh, Stephen Soden and the research assistants and IFLA funding for some of the work. Um, so in terms of what we're up to, we're looking at just, as I said, tip of the iceberg. We're just really trying to understand at the industry level uh, what, what are these developments and are they impacting accountability conversations. And as I will clarify in a minute, some of these conversations are happening formally through annual report. Sometimes they're actually happening out with the annual report in separate reports. And then, as I said, beyond that, there can be other conversations. Um, and as I said, we are looking specifically in UK context. So this is, I think, an original contribution. We're just looking at the top insurers, the top pension schemes, and some of these schemes have been, if you like, predefined for us by the Environmental Audit Committee inquiry last year. So as I said, in terms of the TCFD, it's not my role here today to give you the detail on that. I will refer you to their website in terms of the recommendations, but there are four areas, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics and targets. And I would like to point out to the audience that for financial industry, the risk management areas are important. Um, obviously, if you're an oil and gas firm, um, climate change has a big impact in terms of performance metrics like carbon emissions. Now, what's interest to, to our working party is that actually, you know, pension schemes and insurers are not really, you know, big heavy hitters on carbon emissions. But as, in, as, the, as the biggest investors and capital transformers in the markets, they have a big impact surrogate-wise in terms of their policies, in terms of their assessments of their investments and so forth. So I think it's an important thing to point out that we've got these four areas, but risk management is obviously a key issue for many of the audience here as well. Now, I am going to go through the next few slides a bit quick because these are kind of quite detailed obligations. So some, some of the obligations on climate change, particularly for insurance firms, are already embedded either through uh, Companies Act requirements generally, the, the, the Corporate Governance Code, uh, DEFRA, obviously, and there are also accounting standards. But these are quite specific um, and not really relevant to today. What is relevant to today are what we call the voluntary guidelines in connection with the topic. So I will make reference to the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, so not to confuse you. These are kind of issued 2015. They've actually just been updated this year to reflect climate risk, it's not in our paper. And that's really more protocols of not just those four elements I referred to, but of a number of other elements. But these are just kind of generic protocols. Um, whereas the climate-related financial disclosure, the task force was quite specific as to, quite literally, 11 recommendations within these four areas. So the difference between the bottom one and the top one we're looking at the bottom one, uh, and it's a bit more kind of uh, bespoke and specific to the topic. Uh, I'm just going to skip over that slide, because there's a bit of um, uh, replication between that slide and the next one. 
What I would like to point out to you today is that in looking at this issue, um, we, we've, we've tried to think of a conceptual way of understanding the area. Um, and if you go into the environmental ethics literature, actually there, are, there is, if you like, a formal uh, communication, and that's the, the primary focus. So if you look at the bottom, who matters, what matters, this is a conversation that goes on between the, the reporting entity and its primary stakeholders, its shareholders, the creditors, credit rating agencies, regulators, etc. But actually the top figure is actually going a little bit beyond just the formal conversation that goes in annual report and actually saying, are they what we call engaged in the area? Are they actually not just reporting on it to, you know, to, to kind of rubber stamp a requirement, tick a box, but are they actually engaging either through joining voluntary um, you know, UNEDP or, or you know, principle of, of responsible investments? Are they actually um, going beyond just a formal conversation and actually you know, actively engaging uh, through that. So, so we've got this kind of picture here to emphasise the fact that it's both a formal, we're looking at both the formal disclosures that meet the specific TCFD, but then we've also tried to go beyond that to look at more informal disclosures that are perhaps done out with of the annual report, but evidence that the organisation is engaging in the topic more generally. So as I said, I want to make sure I'm, I'm not going to kind of waste our time nattering on about this. As I said, um, the TCFD um, has undertaken quite extensive research on the topic. So in the year after it implemented the scheme, it then did an analysis 2018, about a week ago, quite literally, they've just updated it to 2019. They do expect it can take up to five years for organisations to fully implement TCFD. Um, but basically, they are just looking globally and they are only looking at the top guns, OK? They, they, they're not looking at national trends, and I think that's the difference between us. We're looking at UK bespoke rather than looking at the international trends. Um, but there's a bit of conflicting results, um, and I think it's part of the methodology, so we've tried to implement some of their methodology at a more granular level but there is a little bit of conflict between the, you know, their results for insurers on the one hand seem positive on one level but negative on another. They didn't look at asset owners in 2018. They probably have done that in the latest one. Uh, but um, there, there are some issues there and I think there is a role for this research to contribute to that effort. As I said, in terms of explanations, one of the things we would like to understand is why. Why do firms, why do pension schemes actually go to the hassle of complying with the requirements? Is it because they want legitimacy uh, with, with the main, you know, the main organisations they're dealing with? Um, is it just managing impressions? Um, is it actually trying to reduce uncertainty by the key stakeholders about their exposure to the area? Um, or is it just that they want to have a bit more engagement with the stakeholders more generally, being conscious of these emerging, almost legal uh, risks that are coming up with unhappy pensioners and other stakeholders concerned about the area? Um, and as I said, we've just tried to think about that as a high level point. It's not something, uh, a big impact, but it's something we started to think about. Um, Prior research, I won't go through all the detail, there's plenty of evidence of research. I will point out to you beyond that slide, uh, there are now about a dozen papers in what's called Social Science Research Network, where papers are coming out on climate change risk, but because the, the requirements have only just come out, there is lack of research on the topic. In terms of our specific research, obviously we do two things. The main thing is to look at the TCFD requirements on climate risk, as I said, that bottom line, what goes on an annual report, are they adopting it as requested? And then more generically, are they, are they uh, engaging not necessarily in a specific uh, area of report, but are they having narrative? Are they having a conversation in the report where they are engaging uh, with other organisations, they're doing something on the reporting um, and they're actually implementing 
into their strategy, into their actual decision making. Um, we then try to go a little bit further looking at some of these theories to see what's the explanation, what's the reason they're actually engaging or not. And then finally, we've got a few examples of best practice. Now, in terms of the insurance firms, we've kind of more or less picked up, backed out from the top uh, pension schemes. As I said, we looked at the top 15. Now, some of these numbers in terms of total assets, I've just picked that up from the, the, the latest consolidated balance sheet. But Paul's pointed out there are some questions about do they include policyholder assets or not. Um, and unfortunately, some of them, I thought they were UK firms, but actually Old Mutual, the only report I could find was an, what they call an integrated report produced through the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Um, so I had to convert that from RAND. And British Insurance, for some reason, uh, puts their accounts in dollars, not pounds. Um, on the pension schemes, a little bit more, you can see less, uh, more homogenous uh, list. And what I've got here, I've just taken that straight from the Environmental Audit Committee report, the parliamentary report. Now, these 15 schemes, they start with USS. You'll notice on the right-hand side, uh, the, the parliamentary committee made a judgment as, as to whether they thought the trustees, in responding to their request as to what they do about climate risk, were they more engaged, were they engaged or less engaged? So less engaged means they kind of weren't doing anything. Engaged means they kind of equating climate risk to ESG. Um, and more engaged means they're actually doing something about climate change. So now I've only got 15. Why 15? Because they're the only 15 pension schemes which voluntarily produce their accounts on the web. So the problem with this research is that whereas with public companies they are required by law to produce their annual reports um, and that is then publicly uh, produced, it goes through company's house, right? Pension schemes don't have that requirement at all. So it turns out there are actually 25 pension schemes that were surveyed by the Environment Committee but only 15 of those actually got their accounts on the web which we could analyse. So that's why we got the 15. Um, so in terms of research design, quickly have a look at the TCFD analysis and then we looked a little bit more at the, the more generic disclosures out with the specific annual report obligation and then we did a little bit of empirics which is a little bit noddy to be honest uh, based on 15 schemes and then we did a qualitative review. We just identified the top disclosures. So in terms of the basic findings, this is kind of um, high level. So obviously out of the 11 separate op, you know, recommendations, um, so out of nine, it turns out the pension schemes have on average disclosed more. But that's not a particularly good picture because actually it's only a few schemes and a few insurers that seem to have more or less fully implemented the requirements. So if we look at the insurers, and I've got two columns here, one in 2017, one 2018. So we were able to get both years since TCFD, the latest reports that mostly came out in March this year. You can see slight increment. And these are individual insurers. Now, I'm not allowed to say which insurers they are. But basically, for those insurers that do seem to have implemented it, there's only three out of the 15 that have really done a, a comprehensive job. And you can see there's a gradual improvement. For the pension schemes out of the 15, only four seem to have really implemented it. I've only got one column because I don't yet have access to the 2018 accounts, right? So they don't need, they, don't, they take more than two months to produce their accounts. It's more like they're going to have to wait six months. So I haven't got the 2018 accounts. These are the first accounts. So you can see, you know, it's only those four that have really made a big effort to more or less 100% implement the obligations or requests of TCFD. Now the next few slides are just pie charts, and I'm, I'm, I'm just conscious of the time here, but obviously these, this is now looking not necessarily at TCFD, this is looking at this engagement area, and there are three areas we identified. Um, one was um, engagement with outside organisations, are they a member of ClimateWise, are they a member of UNEP, all these kind of clubs, right? where if you belong to them, and so I'm a member of them, then, then somehow, you know, it makes me look good. And it turns out that 
In terms of the insurers and the pension schemes, um, the pension schemes, you know, there's quite a mix between those who do and do not uh, engage, whereas for the insurers it's a little bit more ambiguous, so we couldn't really pick it out. Uh, for the reporting and policy issues, uh, do they engage in terms of reporting and policy? Uh, pension schemes were more engaged than the insurers. In, in fact, as you could see from the other slide, there were four, four pensions rather than three insurers. Um, and then finally for action taken. Action taken, do they actually implement the requirements in terms of their actual investment strategy? Do they challenge their investors and say, look, we're concerned about climate risk, what are you doing, you oil and gas firm? Are you actually doing something about it in terms of reducing emissions or not? If you don't, I'm going to divest from you. Okay. So obviously they were really taking action in terms of implementing the requirements through their strategy. And again, you can see the insurers, you know, it's a little bit more of a mix. So the problem I think with the insurers, you've got a slightly more heterogeneous group. You've got general and life, and then you've got public and private whereas the pension schemes are more or less more homogenous. Um, and then in terms of generic, we wanted to find out, OK, of the 15 who did voluntarily produce their annual report, as opposed to the 10 that didn't, was there a difference in terms of their generic position on climate risk as reported in their obligatory uh, answer to the uh, uh, parliamentary inquiry? And yeah, we do notice it's not a huge difference, but for the publishing schemes that the 15, there is generally a more engagement than, than the ones who don't voluntarily produce their accounts on the web. That, that, that slide was put up because I was a bit frustrated as a researcher not having access to that information. Um, now, the next couple of slides, I'm going to kind of slightly kind of skate over because this is where we're trying to understand reasons why does the pension scheme or insurer choose whether or not to put their information in compliance with TCFD or more generally? So degree aligned is how many of the 11 did they agree with? Uh, engagement score is out of the, you know, the 11 topics we chose, uh, or 16 topics in these free generic areas, did they engage in those topics? And then we chose a whole lot of uh, other variables that might align, so liability risk, we really thought that in terms of information asymmetry. Obviously, size is about political visibility. We've also got the investment risk side. And then there are more, more other kind of governance issues like outside directors on the board, um, type of business, uh, are they general or life? And then for uh, pensions, are they single employer or multi-employer? Ownership structure, uh, public sector, private sector for pensions. Uh, publicly listed entity, PLC versus private or, or, or uh, mutual for insurer, and then eventually the type of entity. Um, as I said, I won't go through that detail in a minute. There's kind of a bit kind of knotty um, econometric work, which I kind of like to do, but nobody else likes to do. So I'll just kind of <laughs> mention that, you know, in terms of the degree of alignment, obviously information asymmetry, you know, if you look at you know, Bloomberg and all all the rest of the gang who, who developed TCFD was really about you know, informing the market about this information through the financials, so it's really to do with uh, information asymmetry. In terms of generic disclosures, our suspicion was it's more like a political visibility, legitimacy story about showing to um, the members that they're actually engaging in the area. So as I said, um, not, not really great results. We find some kind of structural variations uh, so typically the life insurers tend to be more uh, active in the space than the general. Uh, the public sector schemes are more active in the space than the private schemes. And in terms of the alignment with disclosures, obviously information asymmetry is a driver, but we have to be very tentative with our results. We've got a very small sample, so I'm not really confident about kind of putting my neck out on these results. Um, and in terms of you know, political visibility seems to be driving a lot of the action here. So it tends to be the larger organisations, right? Size matters, okay? Um, the larger you are, the more visible you are, the more um, complexity you are, the more kind of expertise you'll have to actually address these issues. Um, now, we've got a few examples of, just in terms of these three or four insurers and three or four pension schemes examples of 
of the kind of disclosures that we can see. So in terms of the insurer, what we picked out was there, 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 there's a narrative where they're actually connecting the climate risk and then they're relating it to the, um, the, the regulatory authority requirements. So they mention transition risk, you know, they mention uh, the link to, to physical risks and, and that they're incorporating it into their policy. So that just seems to be a little bit more you know, um, subtle, a little bit more kind of rich than, than insurers who don't address climate risk specifically in their narrative. In terms of risk management disclosures of a pension scheme, wow, it's really like cookie cut. You know, they are really quite literally saying, so in this pension scheme they would actually cite the actual requirement of the TCFD, which we've done in highlight, and then they would answer each of those points. So there are three areas within the risk management category. Remember, there were four of them, right? So risk management, there were three. So they were actually having each, A, B, C, they would actually have a statement about what they were doing. Um, and they would say, this is a material risk. Um, you know, we're engaging it with it under ESG, um, carbon footprinting. So they're really having a narrative that's, that's specifically addressing the requirement. Um, in terms of the more generic disclosures, so we're now not looking at, you know, TSCD, we're now just looking generally. So again, just an example here of an insurer, hey, we belong to a big club, we're big guys, right? So we belong to the Asset Owned Disclosure Project, we're a signatory to the Carbon Disclosure Project, you know, we're, we're, you know, and actually we're even ranked in the Climate Insurance Index. So they really, and they mention the UNEP, um, so, you know, and they're actually implementing that. So that's really quite sophisticated in our opinion that they are really engaging, aren't they, with these external organisations and implementing TCFD and climate risk. Whereas for the pension scheme, as you can see, it's a slightly different kind of category. They're in clubs, but these are clients slightly different clubs. So principles of responsible investment, institutional investor group on climate change as well. And, you know, and then they mention the climate action group of investors. So clearly th these pension schemes are you know, really demonstrating leadership in this area within their space. Right, so in terms of conclusion, um, I'm kind of slightly um, kind of, I think I'm in time, Paul, so I can, I can, I yeah. can say a few more things. So, so um, as I said, I've kind of sped through this kind of 100 miles an hour um, Australian uh, chat, but basically, um, TCFD, look, you know, it's really only a minority of entities that have really specifically, explicitly uh, addressed TCFD. Not saying they're going to do something, but saying they've actually done something to address it now. Um, as I said, reputation risk is obviously a big concern for the, for the insurers, especially for those who are engaged uh, at the coalface with the, with the insurance actions. Uh, pension schemes, it seems to be a little bit more of a concern with the funding policy. And as I said, these are tentative results. On the generic results, um, they do seem to be addressing the area on the investment strategy. But as I said, we are quite literally talking about a few large listed insurance firms and actually mainly public sector, local government pension schemes that are really seem to be doing something about this. So I said, lots of, lots of restrictions. Obviously, we've been doing this work, you know, quite literally as, as these reports have been coming out in the last month. TCFD came out last week. Uh, so that's, that's a concern. Obviously, we want to keep this space open as the years go on. Small sample size. Honestly, we've only been restricted to the available information, especially on the pension scheme space that was created by the parliamentary inquiry, which had to make... Uh, trustees are uh, transpar transparent and accountable to things they wouldn't otherwise put in the public space. Um, and so, and obviously we are looking only at hard information sources, so we haven't gone into the more kind of nebulous uh, soft media, uh, social media and other platforms uh, that, 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 that organisations are increasingly resorting to to communicate to their stakeholders. Obviously the econometric tests were a little bit noddy but we were just trying to work out what some of the drivers were. Um, and then finally, obviously, the situation is evolving all the time. I mean, the UK government just made an announcement about uh, neutrality 
uh, on, on emissions. There has been international developments ongoing as we speak. So in terms of the recommendations, and this is where I'm kind of, kind of looking towards Paul a bit nervously here, because I'm, I'm saying, okay, I'd like to open this up for discussion. Um, as I said, in terms of the specific kind of tip of the iceberg uh, research, we'd like to have a look at some other entities here. Um, I think there was some coffee conversation. Hey, what about what's the, you know, what, what is the uh, public sector in the UK doing on this? Uh, what is the IFOA actually doing on this? Smaller size entities, obviously, you know, the assumption seems to be only the big guys do a lot of pollution, but what about all the SMEs and firms that aren't big? And then other countries. I mean, obviously, Australia, where I know, you know a whole election actually was fought on climate change. It wasn't fought on Brexit. Um, it seemed to be more of an, an issue in those countries than perhaps in the UK on the policy level. As I said, further research, obviously, we, we, we haven't gone down and drilled down to these four different areas within TCFD, we like to do that. Obviously, some of the colleagues would like to look a bit more in terms of the strategy, pricing, reserving, what are the connections to capital management. So actually, you know, we do think the climate risk reporting does need some further work. I think, you know, if, if I can be totally honest for a minute, I do feel a lot of this is being driven at the asset side as an accountant. Um, so a lot of consulting actuaries are pushing this, but actually what about the liability side? You know, what about, you know, and, and we, we've got court cases coming up uh, with people being unhappy about organisations' role on climate risk. So what's the actuary's role in connection with the funding of, of, of insurers and pension schemes? Uh, isn't that an issue that should be addressed by the actuaries specifically? All right, okay, that's it. Uh, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I think it is, uh, it's very useful, I think, to have a, a viewpoint from an, an accountant, or be uh, almost uh, an actuary as well. Because uh, it is uh, obviously very much in, in that area, and we, we, we have to work together. I, I, I realised I didn't introduce myself uh, earlier on, and there was no one else to introduce me. So, uh, so I'm, uh, I used to be on the Resource and Environment Board um, until a couple of years ago, and I'm now on the, the Research Committee, Research and CPD Committee of the Resource and Environment Board, which is why I am the late substitute for the person who was going to chair this meeting, who unfortunately is ill today, but I'm very happy to be here to do that. Um, this, I think the TCFD, it is, as a, although it started, uh, the recommendations came out two years ago, it's very much, uh, in the, we're very much in the early stages of the implementation period, and it's a moving target. Things are happening all the time, there's new surveys and reports coming out, so I think it's great credit to Paul's working party that they, um, they got together and uh, produced this paper to see where we are now and brought out um, some of the issues. Um, in my view, the TCFD is, is a really important issue. It's not just about disclosure, because if you're looking at those slides, what it's about primarily is how you approach climate change. It's about your strategy, your risk management, um, and all, all the rest of it. You've got to do that first before you can start disclosing anything. And that's the fundamental thing. The disclosure, if you like, is, uh, is, is very important, and it's, it's important for, other, for the users of accounts and for other people as well. And it's important for us now, for example, in seeing what uh, the, the people who are early adopters, what, what they've done. And there, there are some very good examples, as Paul um, has already um, said. Uh, perhaps just to touch on, whilst you're thinking about the, the questions and comments you'd like to make, um, there is this distinction between pension funds and insurance companies. Uh, in the main, we're talking about uh, listed, quoted insurance companies, and obviously they have to produce accounts, and they're highly regulated, and they're disclosed. Pension funds, they're, they're regulated, um, but, and they have to produce accounts, but they don't have to disclose them. Uh, so it appears a bit of an uh, anomaly, but of course, pension funds are private institutions between employers and um, their members, their employees, or is it between the, the, uh, uh, the owner of a personal pension policy and the insurance company? It's a private thing, but of course, the justification 
for making it a public thing is that we've all contributed a huge amount in uh, tax relief, as Philip Hammond keeps telling us, um, for pension funds. Uh, and also there's, there's massive funds involved which have huge influence on the economy. So I think there's a strong case for saying that pension funds ought to be disclosing more. I know pension, you know, I was, was originally a pension fund actuary and uh, pension fund actuaries or anybody working in the pension fund industry will tell you that they, they've had enough of new requirements being uh, gratuitously placed on the industry. But here we're not talking about new requirements, all we're saying is the report and accounts you produce, including hopefully your, your attempt at the TCFD disclosures, is made public on the, on the website. So it's just a, bit, a few uh, clicks. We're not asking you to do any extra work. But I think that would be quite an important um, feature. As I say, the TCFD is voluntary. It's voluntary for everyone, for insurance companies and pension funds. Um, but the disclosure is important because there's a, the, there's a public, obviously, um, incentive for people to disclose, as Paul has already um, described, um, and, and for uh, pension funds themselves. So if you introduce a requirement to, for pension funds to make their documents public, I'm only talking about the largest pension funds, of course, um, that would add further impetus to the development of these the adoption of the TCFD um, re recommendations. Um, questions now. If um, please, uh, as we've already said, if you could clearly state your name and speak into the uh, microphone. The questions could be about the paper itself, or you may have comments, or perhaps comments about your own experiences in relation to TCFD. And I've got a just behind you, Lewis, the, the first chapter. You, yes, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, Martin White. Paul, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I could be making a point that's a bit simplistic here, so apologies if, it, apologies if it's too obvious. It's about the nature of the risks to insurers, as insurers rather than investors. From the point of view of an insurer, if you, keep, if you can keep reassessing your premiums and controlling your acceptances each year, to cover the likely losses in that year. The problem of climate change, as far as it impacts your insurance result, is difficult, but probably not life-threatening. You have to think carefully in relation to your investment strategy, of course, and also reputation risk. But there's another way in which things could conceivably hurt insurers. What might happen to the insurance industry if claims to their assureds emerge that relate to past years that you can no longer charge premiums for? For example, the energy companies could conceivably be in the frame. Is that something that you've discussed in the working party? Can I just ask you to repeat the very last thing you said? So just the very okay. last thing. The last point was, um, if you have insured energy companies yeah. over the years, and something happens, some change in the law happens, that they suffer, let's say, a class action when an island floods, um, and somehow it comes back to an insurance claim, through to the insurance industry, that is an unmanageable aggregation. Is that something that you've thought about or that you've seen insurance companies discuss in their disclosures? What I've seen is two things. I mean, um, and this is kind of, it's just really hot stuff that's really coming out right now. So what I've noticed, in terms of the general insurers, they seem to be giving this motherhood statement that of the three risks, right, physical risks, transition, and liability risks, they don't seem to think it's very important. So that's one thing I've seen. The other thing I've seen, not just in terms of class action against energy firms, but actually US governments are now taking uh, oil and gas firms to court uh, for things like breaches of uh, defences of uh, flood walls and things like that. And they're using climate change to actually justify actions against ONG firms. Now, I don't know. You know, I've just seen that in the FT about four days ago, and I haven't looked into this, but yeah, I mean, I think there is action going on, and I, I don't know if my answer. What I will say to you is that what we have noticed is that of the insurers, especially more if you like, my, if I may say in the general space, they seem to be kind of demoting or, or putting down the liability risk as not being a, a major issue for them. That's what they're saying. 
Louise. Thank you. Um, Louise Prime, just going to stand up the front because I hate having my back to everybody who's listening. Um, I'm actually chair of the Resource and Environment Board of the IFOA, and I thought it would be useful if at this stage I said something about what the IFOA is doing on this front. Firstly, as the TCFD proposals have gone through consultation and so on, the IFOA has responded to the consultations and been generally very supportive because we believe that disclosure and transparency are basically good things. Um, the Resource and Environment Board has supported various working parties that are preparing practical guides for actuaries in various fields about how um, climate risk might affect the work they're doing. So we've so far um, published, as far as I'm aware, and things are coming a bit thick and fast at the moment, practical guides for actuaries in pensions and defined contribution defined contribution pensions with supporting um, documents on financial assumptions, mortality, and covenant assessment. Now, many of those contain very useful information for people working in other fields as well, especially, of course, life insurance. We have guides for life insurance actuaries, general insurance actuaries, and investment actuaries that are, as we speak, being slaved over. Um, and should be out quite soon. And we also have a general guide on an introduction to climate change for actuaries. Um, as you are aware, there is a risk alert that was issued a couple of years ago saying that all actuaries should at least be aware of whether they are taking climate risk into account in the work they do and the advice they give to their clients. So that's what we've been doing. That's me speaking as chair of the RE board. On a personal level, I'm going to say to you that climate risk is a huge problem. It's a significant financial risk. And if you're not thinking about it on behalf of your clients, you should be. There's a huge reputational risk here, both for you personally and for the profession as a whole. If things go horribly wrong, which they are quite likely to do, and actuaries haven't been telling the people they are advising about long-term financial risks that this is a long-term financial risk. It is not going to be good. We were talking about liability risk, and I think that actuaries possibly face liability risk themselves on this front. So do think about that. Also, many actuaries come up to me and ask, what can I do, or what can they do, as it happens, I'm getting my pronouns confused here, what can I do to, uh, about climate change? What can I do to help? Actuaries can help by talking about the risks, the financial risks of climate change to their clients. It's widely accepted now that one of the best things anyone can do is just to talk about the problem, because that will help more people become aware of what's going on. So if you talk to your clients about this, you are doing a good thing, in my view. This is my personal opinion. Also, there are huge opportunities here in the TCFD and disclosures world. We have a lot of actuaries working in insurers, especially um, working on um, um, basically the ORSA process. A lot of them are, I know, getting involved in climate-related disclosures, and that seems to be the part of insurers that's especially concerned with the TCFD thing. And there are huge opportunities here for actuaries, both in the insurance world and working with other professionals, um, to help not only insurers, but other entities in their TCFD uh, disclosures. So think about that. And then just getting back to putting my official hat on again, we are also starting, it's due to have its first meeting within the next month or so, a joint working party with IEMA, the Association of um, Sustainability Consultants, on a user's guide to TCFD. So what can people reading the TCFD disclosures expect to get out of them and how can they use them? And we believe that this will also help people preparing the disclosures think about what should go into them in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Just to elaborate on that last thing um, which Louise uh, mentioned, the, the working party, I think, the, the, uh, I gather the, uh, you can't, the, the, the volunteering opportunity is now closed, but uh, it's sure to get off the ground. It, it's with the Institute of Environmental Management and Assessment. So it's, it's going right outside of the, the traditional sphere. So it's quite an exciting uh, development um, for actuaries that working with that organization. Um, Mike. Good evening. I think Louise uh, has the right approach. Uh, my name is Mike Clark. Uh, the attendee list may confuse you. Um, these views are my personal views, my professional views, and the views of my company. Uh, we have not employed, to my knowledge, and I'm the only person who employs people, a Mike Duckworth, so maybe there are only too, too many Clarks on the list, and they decided to change my surname. Um, firstly, I thank Paul for this paper. Uh, it was a very interesting paper. It is the only paper that's ever made me miss a tube stop. Heading from Oxford Circus here, I got to St. Paul's and realized I had to turn around. It has also reminded me how little of my old statistics I know, and I think the raising awareness is a great thing. Uh, firstly, a bit of full disclosure. Um, Paul has already referred to the letter which the House of Commons EAC wrote to 25 pension schemes the author stands before you. He also worked with Client Earth to follow up on that letter, and some of you may be aware of the letters that Client Earth, those excellent lawyers, wrote to some of the pension schemes, um, collating their reply and then sending them five pages of what they should do next. Uh, I claim some credit for them not writing to the whole lot because actually, the more engaged, we should begin to applaud what they're doing rather than criticize them. Uh, I also represent the IFOA on the Oxford Smith School uh, Sustainable uh, Finance Program. And um, as an aside, you can imagine with a well-known MP for Brighton, when they draw the lines between more engaged, engaged, and less engaged, some MPs on the EAC may have drawn the lines in a slightly different place. It also raises for me an interesting public policy issue. The TPR could have done that, but Parliament went round the TPR and asked some questions directly. So I think it's an interesting public policy issue that we may wish to reflect upon. Uh, moving on to a few facts, uh, we've already referred, um, we've already referred to, um, no, let's pass on that. Um, the Climate Earth Review. Some of you may be aware that a Shell Pension Fund member in this country has complained about the lack of action by his trustees. Uh, that escalated to the trustees. He didn't get a satisfaction, so the complaint is now with the pensions ombudsman. We're not quite sure what's going to happen there, because that's normally about how late contributions have been paid. The pensions ombudsman and client risk seem unusual bedfellows. There's a similar case in Australia, where a member of one pension scheme has complained. Um, moving on to, yes, the risk fact. Um, some of you may be aware there is a public publication identifying the liabilities which have been referred to that actuaries currently bear. So if you haven't seen the Client Earth Guide to Actuaries Liability Risk, I commend it to you. Uh, finishing with a few um, assertions, uh, there's an interesting debate in the actuary at the moment where one or two of our professions seem somewhat um, unconvinced, is that the right word, Louise, of this? So uh, I encourage you to convince any of our members that this is not a relevant risk to uh, evolve their opinion. I think one of the things we miss is evaluation. I think one of the delightful things of Paul's paper is beginning to produce data and evaluate. We don't have enough, in my view, public interest money evaluating. So things like the Asset Owners Disclosure Project, uh, the work of VBDO in the Netherlands, uh, we need more evaluation. Um, opportunities for actuaries, absolutely. Uh, TCFD, uh, modeling of scenarios, um, advocating for carbon pricing. I spend a fair bit of time on that. Um, and I say I admit to meeting Extinction Rebellion, but I couldn't channel their enthusiasm into more productive efforts. They seem very convinced to uh, run WH Smith out of superglue and buy pink boats. Um, 
I've written a piece on the Climate Change Committee suggesting they establish a new uh, uh, subcommittee, the Finance and Investment Subcommittee, because the net zero recommendations which we've now just put into regulation. Um, the finance sector is probably still missing a bit in terms of what could be done. And I think to this point about climate coming out of the sort of ESG morass, I think the one sort of ESG risk which is clearly front and center in asset owner risk is climate. I mean, most ESG issues, bluntly, are investment manager issues, but climate risk is out there. And at that, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to make a comment or ask a question? <clears throat> Can I just make a quick remark about what you were saying with ESG? Because one of the things that I find quite uh, strange as a researcher is that people bandy around ESG, but actually ESG disclosures are often proprietary, so um, it, it, it's not um, an obligatory requirement under any law uh, to produce the ESG scores. A lot of uh, consultancy firms um, have got um, kind of control, if you like, over that. Um, so I think I, I, I'm very cautious about ESG as a concept because it's not to me totally transparent um, and, you know, um, out with the European Parliament uh, actually making uh, statements about legislation for ESG, um, it, it is to me slightly a bit of a rubbery figure, if I may say. Uh, climate change disclosures are more direct disclosures that are more kind of looking at specific aspects of climate risk generally. ESG is a, a little bit of a broad concept and I think the parliamentary committee did discriminate between pension schemes that failed to delineate climate risk accountability from broader ESG conversations. So I think that's just thing I just put in I lob into the the audience. I won't respond. We'll get shorter questions later. Yep. Yeah, okay. I think Paul mentioned in the um, in, in the paper and presentation that uh, one of the uh, possibilities is for the for actors to get involved in implementation in relation to uh, the TCFD uh, recommendations. Um, certainly, um, that must be the case in, in relation to our traditional fields like insurance and pension funds, because it's all about looking to the future, and say so looking at strategy and things like that. Could I, uh, with the power I have now, could I ask just for a straw poll? Who, who could somebody? Could you raise your hands if you've actually been involved in your organisation in some way with uh, uh, investigating TS, TCFD? seeing what you might do with it in your organisation or how you might advise on it. Okay. Yes, so, and I think maybe the follow-up question is, you know, is that an ongoing action? You know, we're thinking about that for next year or you actually have already done it? Is it already being done? Or are you just saying, let's have a conversation about it for next year? Yes. <laughs> Who's actually, again, should we just see, um, could, you, could you raise your hand if you were involved with a general insurance operation, either a consultant or as a, in, the, in the company? So there's not many. Um, life assurance? Not many. Uh, five and a half. Oh, and no. um, so the, I presume the rest of, of the audience here is involved with pensions then. Yeah, so that's, that's the great uh, uh, majority. So it's disappointing that our colleagues um, are, not, uh, are not joining us. The, um, there was an interesting quote actually in the, 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 the recent meeting of the Pension and Lifetime Savings Association that 50% um, of the audience hadn't heard of the TCFD. I mean, you could say 50% had, I suppose that would be, that's, you know, that's good news, but 50% uh, hadn't. And I think pensions is the, 
It's the traditional problem that our clients are, are lay people, aren't they? They're not experts in this field. And so this is just one, if you like, it's one of many issues where we, we have a, we, we, we're trying to um, uh, provide the services they require and at the same time uh, get them involved in, in new areas, which is, which is a, a problem. Paul, can I just make another quick clarification? I mean, sorry, I'm talking about this as an accountant. Um, but obviously, um, it's to do with the level of um, the level the level of entity, the unit of analysis. So TCFD seems to be kind of cookie cutting to firms which are listed uh, and where there is what we call a reporting entity uh, that 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 then um, has not just insurers but maybe other entities. Whereas I suspect many of those in the audience might actually just be working for a regulated entity which is underneath or a subsidiary to uh, what we might call the reporting entity, the consolidated entity. So I think that part of the mismatch could be that, um, like in my research, right, I just focused on UK insurers which were based in the UK. So I didn't look at AIG, I didn't look at AXA or, you know, because these are, are foreign entities where there are lots of climate reporting obligations in those countries for the reporting group in that country. But if those entities play a big role in insurance in this country, but their regulated subsidiary um, is, is, is reporting up to, to Paris or, or Frankfurt, and not to London, then they, you know, it will not be um, seen as at, at the same level, if you like, uh, because I'm assuming, sorry, I counted again, there's a lot of, uh, of action going on here uh, w within the organisation, if you like, at the head office where there's a, a communication going on uh, with the sustainability director or, you know, at, at that level. So I think that's where I think, you know, I'm a little bit concerned with the conversations here that if you're talking at a regulated entity concept, yes, you are concerned about PRA, you are concerned about that. But a lot of our research, I'm sorry to clarify, we were just looking at the reporting entity. And so I was assuming you're UK, and number two, you know, your job is to have a conversation with communication directors as well as just um, other actuaries. Mm. Sorry, just clarification. Yeah, I suppose in, in relation to, to pension funds, so to say, which we, have got a different uh, disclosure um, uh, re regime, the, there are, of course, a number of different actors involved in any event. You know, we've got the actuary who's advising the trustees, maybe a different actuary advising the company, you may have a different actuary advising on investment uh, policy and, and strategy. And you've got the accountant doing one here, whatever he does. Uh, <laughs> um, and, the, and, and the lawyers as well. So, and it's, any, any one of those um, parties is, ha, may not feel he has the authority or, or whatever to actually engage with this, which, which is a relatively uh, new area. I don't know whether um, people whether people think that is a barrier. I mean, you're, if you're the advising on funding or accounting, you know, the actuarial accounting numbers, whether you feel able oh. to uh, try and extend your being. I'm sure you would, Mike. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, as a transparency issue, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I was almost inclined in the working party to ignore the pension scheme, and I would just go to the sponsoring organisation, where, of course, they've got to report the pension liabilities under the gap. Um, but of course, the actuarial assumptions underlying pension costs, uh, where, where you will see all the liabilities being disclosed uh, if through the covenant, may well be different sets of assumptions. And the trustee, the trustee is uh, depending on, in terms of the advice given by the pension fund scheme actuary and they can just use different discount rates and they're not required under the SORP or under FRS uh, 102 to have to, um, what we call in accounting, recognise any um, liability. It's just the assets. Paul, can I ask, ask you a question? The, 
how, with your experience, um, you know, your, the, the accounting experience, and you, you've also got a perspective internationally, I mean, how would you, how do you see, how would you expect to see things developing as regards TCFD? I think part of it's a cultural conflict, so part of it's about the Americans and, you know, the, the, the kind of capitalist perspective which really looks at TCFD hitting what they call asset owners. Um, so the assumption is that, you know, it's the asset owners, the asset side is the element. That's what, that's what I was saying earlier about sovereign wealth funds, you know, they're asset owners as well. Um, on the other hand, you know, if you go into continental Europe and, and, and other countries where uh, the model in, in the pensions is less, um, less laissez-faire and it's more an explicit contract uh, in terms of having liability obligations, you will see a greater emphasis in countries like Germany, for example, where you know, the, the risk reporting obligations are there, there are a lot of these obligations are unfunded, and so the, the conversation on climate risk will then evolve, not so much on the asset side, but a bit more on the liability side. Um, so I think um, in terms of the Australian conversation, we're kind of a little bit in between those ships because climate risk is very much up in the public space. And as was mentioned earlier by Mike, you know, there are cases going on. Also, in the governance perspective, public, Mike, there is a clearer governance link to Parliament. Uh, the Ombudsman is more powerful. In fact, in some countries, there are even Ombudsmen for future generations. And so there is a much clearer link to uh, for, for those kind of arguments to take place. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, uh, historically, you could, you could say that, uh, you know, p imposing further requirements on external bodies like pension funds is some is relatively easy thing for governments to do, isn't it? So, um, the, uh, one would, so one might well see them doing that in the, in the future. Um, because most other things are, are much more, more difficult. Did you want to add anything more, Mike? Yeah, I was interested, you, you mentioned that you'd been involved with, uh, not with government, with the Environmental Audit Committee. But of course the parliamentary committees are not necessarily uh, have their way with governments, do they? <laughs> you may want to time limit on this. I'm gonna make a few remarks and some of them responding to the good Paul's points that Paul's made. Let's also look at this another way. I'm sort of hearing this conversation as regulators and policy makers making us do something we don't really want to do. It's more work. That actually, and I'm trying to go back to your triangle, I would argue it is both the right thing to do and a good thing to do. I don't think I mentioned it in my initial remarks, but I'm a non-exec on the board of one of the new pooling companies. Many of you will be familiar with Labour Authority Pension Pooling. My board, all eight of us, are absolutely committed to this being a risk to the beneficiaries of our clients. And if regulation ever caught up with us, I think we'd be slightly disappointed. We're doing this because it's the right thing and good thing to do. And I think for an actuarial profession that quite often looks at issues as sort of another regulatory poke in the back, I just offer that. Uh, picking up some of Paul's points, um, the California Insurance Commissioner, uh, because there's a blessed regulation which means the whole insurance portfolio is listed on the insurer's website, uh, the California so, um, Commissioner, Dave Jones, who's actually just stepped down, he did an assessment of California insurance companies and since, since the 612, that's something that's been done. Uh, in Switzerland, the pensions and insurance regulator did a similar thing. He didn't have the power to ask for information so he evolved a cunning wheeze whereby there's a little firm called the Two Degrees Investing Initiative that some of you will know. They collected the information from the insurance companies, aggregated it, and gave it to the regulator, who then said, that's rather bad, we're heading to five degrees. If I was advocating some CPD, actually, yeah, let's ask a question. Has, how many people have engaged with the IPCC report from the last quarter of last year, which talks about 1.5 degrees. Anybody read the executive summary? One. Two. 
three. And counting or just three? I mean, that is what is happening. Um, without getting over emotion in actual audience, I mean, this is a climate catastrophe heading our way. So if this evening just helps you think about this in, um, how can I put this? In terms of my grandchildren, or not many of you have probably got grandchildren yet, and a spreadsheet, uh, and reducing the spreadsheet, you know, that's what's going on. Um, to regulation, um, to your non-UK point, uh, there is the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS to its friends. So the regulators are um, joining up. So there, is global, there are global conversations amongst regulators. Uh, I wrote that one down. Um, the PRA, I couldn't possibly speak for the PRA, but my understanding is that when the regulation that not only boards have to be aware, but the wonderful senior management function will have some people having climate risk in their responsibilities so that when things go wrong, um, we know who to go to. Um, I am told that if any bright spark on the 16th of October, the day after they come out, says, well, I'm delighted to have climate risk as part of my SMF, um, I'll start reading up on it. Uh, I believe a conversation may follow. So things are happening. Um, there's a sort of missing bit in this, which is investment consultants. Uh, ponder, if you will, why two NGOs had to get 12 investment consultants to sign up a year ago to the following statement, and I paraphrase badly. Uh, we will take the pensions regulators' uh, guidance on climate change risks to our clients. That, to me, seems a bit like doing the day job. But an NGO had to get 12 investor consulting firms to sign up to that. Have I got that right, Louise? Thank you. Uh, let me stop. Yeah, I can certainly um, uh, add to what, uh, or support what Mike was saying. You know, I, I saw a statistic uh, the other day, I think, that uh, uh, emissions in 2018 were, was it 2% higher than the, the year before? Uh, I mean, they had sort of been slightly sort of flatlining a bit um, due to the... Uh, uh, reducing the involvement of coal, but uh, there's no sign at the moment of them actually get, uh, trending down, which is what they need to do as of now, I think, to meet the requirements of the, uh, the UN Climate Change um, uh, Committee. One of the... Um, I was involved with the paper, just, just to uh, emphasise, I suppose, the, and also pl plug my own paper, uh, I was involved with a, a paper on decarbonisation, which uh, you, you can uh, Google. I think it's an in, uh, international actuarial association paper. But it, it's just about um, what the, uh, why are we decarbonising? What are the targets? What does it mean? What are the possible implications for actuaries? And it, it's just something to remind us that, uh, you know, apart from the climate changing, the, in an attempt to mitigate climate change, we're going to be, and we already are, decarbonising. And that, of course, is, is really the, um, for a lot of pension funds and insurers, it's the big issue because it, it obviously has a huge effect on their investment uh, uh, strategies. Um, and it's, it's the one thing which they, they need to take account of as of now. I mean, talking about um, disclosure, the, we know that there, it's inching forward as regards pension funds. From October, I think they have to define contribution schemes, have to disclose their statement of investment principles and how they're dealing with uh, climate change. And I think as from next October, 2000, 2020, uh, defined benefit will also have to do that. So that's fine, but it's really, again, it's more piecemeal disclosure and um, what we need, as we're talking about a, an accounting standard, um, we need to, for the whole thing to be put in the context of the report and accounts, it seems to me. Mm. I'm happy for people to disagree with these comments, um, and I can try and introduce a bit of balance into the, the chair's uh, intervention. <laughs> 
Paul, do you want to add? Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, obviously, as an accountant, the, the thing that kind of hits me as a kind of a off-the-wall remark is that the TCFD, you know, is saying, well, what about the financial impact of climate change on the accounts? But actually, the accounts, the balance sheet income statement, or the funding position, it's in fair value, um, it's a number, and the assumption behind accounting is going concern. Um, so I'm just, you know, one of the things I've been doing for my own research is looking at, okay, if we look at the impact for credit rating and uh, how, 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 how covenants are, are rated by credit rating agencies, they're not looking at balance sheets and income statements for that, they're looking at cash flow. Uh, so it just seems to me, if you want to have a conversation about the financial impact of climate change, and in the UK context, take into account the concern of the FRC about financial viability, surely it's cash flow, not uh, balance sheet, um, that, that, that's going to, you know, is going to be hit. So I just, it just seems to me the whole, you know, the, the whole accounting, as an accountant, sorry, I'm, I'm speaking of this con contribution to the account, the whole concept of accounting is based on wealth being created through consumption. Um, is, is that the right model uh, to understand the financial impact on climate change when it's about the consumption of a resource that's being consumed now and will not be available in the future? So it's the scarce resource, not, you know, resource consumption. So I just think backing up from this conversation, if you don't mind me saying this, mm. um, you know, the, the thing just to me is that I, I'm worried that the accounting model, as it's been implemented for 500 years, is it really the right model uh, to, to understand the impact of climate change on financials? And I, and I don't think it is. You know, it just, it, one of the challenges of TCFD was, yes, you're saying something about climate change, but what's its impact on your financials? And so what I would answer there is, well, what, which, which financials and what's the best way of modelling that? And it does seem to me actuaries have got a good grasp of, of you know, DCF and, and cash flow, and it just does seem to me that focusing on earnings, focusing mm. on balance sheets is, is not the right uh, way to start having a conversation about climate change. If I can put you up on that, the, I, uh, an interesting point, because I know one um, firm of actuaries is, is, is uh, well, they were, I don't know if they still are, but they were marketing a, a service to um, value um, reserves for oil companies uh, and, and do long-term valuations, basically, in relation to not just the oil industry, but including the oil industry, which I think is very, is very interesting, an interesting departure um, for actuaries. But uh, going back to... Uh, I think you were saying this to the, because one of the issues is, why do we need this? Why, why, why aren't the accounts already giving us a true and fair view? And um, the, as we know, the governor of the Bank of England, I think, said um, um, in, in recent months or years that uh, most of the, or if we're going to combat or t mitigate climate change, most of the reserves of oil, which are now in the ground, will have to stay in the ground. So in other words, they won't be worth very much. But all, all the, in the balance sheets of all these major oil companies, they're showing massive reserves. Uh, there seems to be a bit of a contradiction there. Would you, would you like to comment on that? Well, yes, I mean, obviously, we've got to be careful in the US context, the definition of proven reserves is different from, from that definition that's acceptable under IFRS. And also there's this really subtle point about the discount rate that one can use to discount these reserves. So when the Canadians decided to go from Canadian GAAP to IFRS, suddenly all the oil and gas firms in Canada had to use a much more tougher discount rate uh, that was required under our IFRS. So, so it's, these are quite subtle, subtle kind of um, impacts. But, but you're right, and I think... Um, Part of the problem also is, is that the um, the oil and gas industry in, in you know in the United States, and I have done some research on this, um, don't want to have a conversation about climate change. They're not interested. They, they, you know they, they, they are really um, you know I, I've I've done analysis. I have looked at disclosures by on oil and gas by total 
or by European uh, firms, and they, they, they will have conversations in their reports about climate change, mm. whereas the Americans, they don't want to know about it. They don't care. Mm. That's what I found. Let me offer you a project. I agree with a lot of what you say, and I think I disagree with your balance sheet thing, although you probably weren't saying what I thought you were saying. Um, let me offer you a project that I almost guarantee you an NGO will do in the next five years. An NGO will contact a range of oil companies, and they will say, I see what you say in your balance sheet of the value of reserves. Now, we have some sensible assumptions about the future price of carbon. Please tell us what that number is using these assumptions. So we begin to look at the future bit of the balance sheet based on assumed value of oil, which I would argue is highly likely to be overpriced, or at least the assumption of the value of those reserves is misguided. Well, I think just to respond to that, I mean, it's not just the NGOs. I think also credit rating agencies are um, getting worried about uh, some of these issues. Uh, but certainly the credit rating agencies were consulted on the TCFD uh, recommendations. Um, what I know is that in terms of um, the separate research I've done, looking at US uh, firms, um, the credit rating agencies are, are, are tracking the cash flow. Um, and so when it comes to a when it comes to a marginal decision about, you know, um, spec grade versus investment grade, um, a lot of the oil and gas firms try to manipulate their accounts uh, in order to manage that credit rating threshold. But um, our, our separate research I'm doing softly off, off site is, um, is, is uh, starting to come out that um, actually uh, the credit rating agencies are, um, are, are looking at the fundamentals here. And it's not just, you know, the earnings. Yeah, that's that's uh, encouraging because the obviously the credit rating agencies, particularly after the problems they had in the last crisis, I mean they, they've got to sort of put their money where their mouth is. Yeah. Yeah. Unless there's anybody else wants to make a comment, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll draw it to uh, a, a close now. Could I, I ask those who, um, if, 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 who've made no, if they made any notes of what they were saying, they want to give that to the, the staff that will help them when they're recording uh, uh, the uh, discussion. And um, I think I'm supposed to summarize the discussion, but I think it was a, it was a wide ranging uh, discussion. Um, and I think. The reason there are so many people here, here tonight is we, we are all concerned about this. Um, it's a very live issue. Um, the, it's something uh, you're all going to be grappling with over the coming uh, decades. We're at a relatively early stage, but you know, as Mike said, you know, the, the, bus, the bus left yesterday. You know, we need to do something um, as of uh, now. So it is up to all of us to do what we can in our working lives as well as our personal lives um, in this area. But we're meeting here tonight because of the, the paper produced by Paul Clump's um, working party. And um, I'd like to express my thanks for him and I think we can all thank him in the usual way.